think big, start small, and scale fast. Because if you do things right, you're going to get a lot of momentum. And look, a lot of success is exploiting those opportunities as they come. Episode 125. This is the Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. Now, if you haven't already gotten your ticket for the upcoming Business of Architecture Summit, I highly encourage you to go do that. Do yourself a favor. It's one of the smallest investments you can make. Going to be some great, great presentations. One of them is going to be on how to productize your service. If you've ever found that selling architectural services are hard and you want an easier way to be able to streamline the products or services that you're offering to your clients, you're going to want to catch this presentation on the why and how to productize your services. That's just one sneak peek of topics that are going to be covered. So once again, that's an online-only Business of Architecture Summit. It's going to be happening October 29th and 30th. All the sessions will be recorded so you can have forever access to those and add them to your marketing library. Today I'm picking up our conversation again here with David Coleman, who is the he's a partner at Axiom Consulting Partners, and he's also the author of the book Leading Firms, How Great Professional Service Firms Succeed and How Your Firm Can Too. Today we're going to cover some interesting information about what makes a successful professional services firm? What are the key things that they, that, that they do differently? In addition, if you've ever wondered how to scale a business, uh, David's going to give us some of his top pointers for quickly scaling a business and maintaining your momentum. And with that, here's the second half of my interview with David Coleman. So David, it sounds like, you know, one thing that I, I like to dig into is the challenges that other affiliated industries or, or similar professional services firms are experiencing. And we've touched on one of them, which is talent, personnel development. You know, you mentioned the firm that found that they had a gap in terms of developing talent now to be at a good place in 15 years. I was just opened up the chapter in your book on meritocracy. I mean, this is something that um, that I think firm leaders are thinking about because, you know, we, we hear about the millennials coming out of school now and, you know, there, there's some, some cynicism there, but then also, you know, so we're like, how do we motivate people? How do we create a meritocracy? How do we develop talent to create a great firm? You know, I think a lot of it is, um, about, um, clarity, candor, and movement. Um, so if you're going to create a, uh, and, and I would add consistency. So if you're going to create a meritocracy, um, number one, you got to be clear on the game that you're asking everybody to play. And um, secondly, you've got to position people to win. You know, if you think about millennials, the thing that you know, there's the aspect of millennials that I think drives all of us nuts, which is, you know, they believe they should be running the joint next week, right? <laughs> I On the other hand, um, there's a wonderful aspect of of millennials, which is um, they really come at things with, an, with a why not kind of attitude. Why can't I? So you kind of got to, you got to define the game clearly. And then you got to take out sort of the arbitrary constraints. You know, if I can figure out how to do the next job up in half the time, you're going to let me? 
The answer better be yes, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of it is about sort of getting clear on that, being consistent, really questioning your own assumptions about, well, they're not ready yet and so on. Well, have you put them in client meetings? You know, have you, have you let them talk? Have you seen how clients react? Have you ever really listened, right? I do think that um, a lot of our clients, as they're sort of engaging with millennials, there's all sorts of, you know, boy, these folks come from a different planet kind of experience. But they do, the, these are achievement-oriented people. I mean, they're much clearer on their boundaries than you and I were or that I know I was, you know, sort of, yes, I work here. I'm going to surrender my life. You know, they're clear on their boundaries. Um, and to succeed with them, you kind of got to, you kind of got to accept that, you know, you kind of got to, you know, get clear on what you need and let them be clear on what they need and kind of step up and negotiate as adults. They are much more prepared to engage in that sort of adult to adult, professional to professional interaction than any of us ever were. Um, and just a, you know, um, just a side note, it's interesting because one of my partners has been doing some research on um, gender differences. And the interesting thing is if you look at attitudes of male versus female 50-somethings, very different, Jordan. If you look at differences in attitude between 20-something males and females, much closer together. So in a lot of ways, and I'm not saying that that sort of gender and diversity thing is solving itself, but I do think that there's kind of a convergence around kind of the, what people are looking for that, uh, that, that makes, things, makes things a little easier to manage. Very interesting. What, what are some of the other challenges, David, that you're – you do this on a daily basis that yeah, you're dealing with. I think I, I think the biggest, uh, probably the biggest, most common thing that you hear people talking about is, um, they talk about it in a lot of different ways, but it, a lot of it is about marketing. Mm. But marketing in the sense of how do we rise above the noise? Mm -hmm. See, one of the one of the challenges architects actually have a have a have an advantage in this. Because they actually pr do produce something tan something physically tangible, right? If you're a consultant and somebody says, prove to me that you do good work, you know, I can show you my PowerPoint. I can let you talk to somebody who will say, I do good work. You know, an architect can say, you see that? We did that. Mm -hmm. So that's powerful. But I do think all of us are in a business where it's really easy for people to basically say the same things in a really loud voice, whether it's, it sounds like they're misrepresenting, I don't mean it this way, but whether it's true or not, we're, we are the most creative firm in the business. You know, think about the taglines of some of the firms that you know. You know, we're creative, we're um, the best in, um, sustainable design we're um the we're the most efficient we're really great at large-scale project management you know you think about that and you ask them and they'll sincerely tell you no oh, this is for, and you know you talk to them and you know them and, and you believe it and then you go out and say how many other firms that look a lot like you were basically saying the same things and there's a lot of them why because it's easy and so i really think it I, I really think a lot of firms struggle with how do we sort of project an image of ourselves, our presence, our brand, and so on, that sort of rises above the noise. And I think that's that's and you see that the you know the 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 lawyers have that challenge, the consultants have that challenge, the accountants have that challenge. I think the architects have that challenge. You know, it's pretty mm -hmm. universal. Absolutely. Do any examples come to mind? David, of people you've seen that, that maybe have that ability to rise above the noise that have been able to, to do that? Um, I do think 
that, um, well, I'll give you, um, we asked for examples. Let me give you the most classic example. Um, uh, probably in all of the professions, and, and that's McKinsey. McKinsey and Company is the most widely recognized. They would certainly tell you the most successful, and certainly they have could, can lay claim to that, whether others would debate it or not. Um, yeah. And in a lot of ways, what McKinsey has been very successful at doing, and this is my opinion, this is not necessarily what they'd tell you, um, is they have been cons they have been very successful at being utterly consistent and all moving together. So if you sit down with a McKinsey team in Chicago or a McKinsey team in New York or a McKinsey team in San Francisco or a McKinsey team in Mumbai or a McKinsey team in Dusseldorf, they're going to um, come, they're not necessarily going to talk about the same things, but they're going to come across in the same way. They're going to ask you questions in the same way. They're going to make their pitch based on the same ideas. You know, we're going to improve the performance of your business. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. So there's a real sort of consistency over time, right? That, um, you know, it, and it goes down to, you know, who they hire and how they select and so on. They just, their marketing materials and so on. They're all that sort of what do great organizations do? We've got the information that nobody else has got. You know, we're going to improve you. You know, it's consistent messages. And in a lot of ways, when you look at it, when you look at a McKinsey, um, certainly there are clients out there that don't like McKinsey, but if you look at their client satisfaction, it's astronomical because people keep coming back to them and give them tons of money. And in some ways though, I think what's, what happens when you're that successful with being consistent is there is an experience of being McKinseyized. And they're so consistent, their brand is so clear, particularly at the top levels of organizations, that the people that don't want to be McKinseyized don't call them. What does that do? That means that people love McKinsey. Why? Because the people who aren't inclined to McKinsey never hired them in the first place. Why? Because they were very consistent in, in what's a good client look like to us. You know, they're, they're famous, probably don't do this as much as they say they do, but they're famous for walking away from clients, you know, they, and that's part of the legend in the firm, you know, you know what, we get it for, you're a very successful organization. We get your problem and you know what, it's not the kind of problem we solve. Sorry, we ain't going to do it. So they're very good at sort of knowing what they're great at and only doing that. I think, I think that's the single most, uh, most powerful example in, in all the professions. You know, I can come up with others that are similar, but uh, that's a pretty compelling one, I think. I agree. Well, and you mentioned consistency. Obviously, there's a difference between doing things poorly on a consistent basis and doing things great on a consistent right. basis, right? Uh, what are some of the, uh, how did they get that consistency or how would a company develop that kind of successful consistency? What goes yeah. into that? Yeah, I and I, I I think it's um yeah, and that's uh that is the magic, isn't it? Um because you're right, you know, consistently mediocre does not cut it. Um uh I, I number one um it's it's um it's having a pretty clear view of what you are and what you're not. Great firms are sort of continually re-examining and they're very self-critical and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, there is usually driven by a founder or a, um, or kind of a pivotal figure in the firm's history or a couple of people who are just utterly clear on who we are from a, from a values perspective. And it's not just, you know, we're going to be empowering and so on, but like in a real tangible sense, right? 
values in the sense of what's a good client look like to us. Values in the sense of whether we're going to put the firm first or whether we're going to put money first. You know, and there, there's just this, this, you know, the kind of services we do and how we're gonna how we're gonna add value to clients and and all that. There's just this clear and blazing core that everybody knows, and they don't stray for it, mm-hmm. stray from. And there's a there's kind of an understanding for it, of it. Number one, they are they select for it, and over over some reasonable period of time, they are utterly intolerant of people who don't align with it. Um, and then I think thirdly, they pretty they take that touchstone and they pretty much design everything else about the organization outward from that, right? How are we going to set up our social media marketing? Well, what kind of firm are we? We're a firm that really engages with our clients. And, you know, we ask good questions and, and so on. Great. In what ways is our social media marketing embodying that? Or are we just sending out tweets every day about all these great things we're doing? Because if we're going to be consistent and we're the firm that, um, you know, is continually engaging and learn, engaging with and learning from our clients, simply sending out tweets about our project wins is not going to do a darn thing for us. Engaging in a dialogue and a back and forth through that medium, extracting good ideas from others and playing it back into the communication channel, that's more like how we're going to interact with our clients, right? So it's that sort of, they, they, they work backwards on virtually everything they do. You know, how should a client meeting go? How should a pitch meeting go? What should our pitch materials look like? All that stuff, they work it backwards so that it comes from that sort of clear and blazing core. Got it. Thanks for uh, expounding on that, David. Happy to. David, as we as we close up the interview here, it's been great having you on to share your fun. experience about working with professional services firms, joining us from your office in uh, New Jersey across the country. Any any last thoughts? So my audience here are business owners primarily of architecture firms or architects who are mm-hmm. maybe looking to open their own practice at some time in the future. You know, if you were just sitting down and maybe talking to them in a room, what would be some pointers or some thoughts you'd want to leave them with? Um, uh, I guess my, I guess my, my, my best pointer would be think big, start small and scale fast, right? If you're going to, if you're trying to build something or you're thinking about going out on your own, I, you know, it's look. It's nice to sit around with with the people who are going to help you found the business and have a couple of drinks and really fantasize about what what great thing we could build. But you know what? Think through what are you trying to create here? Not what the final state is, but kind of what's going to be special about it, and how's that going to work, and who do we want our clients to be, and what kind of work do we want to be doing, and sort of get a vision in your head for what the thing. Even if you even if you change it two years from now, what's the thing going to look, look like when we're when we're done? Whatever done in the next stage is. So think big. Secondly, start small. I think uh, find the essential starting points. You know the two or three things, two or three clients, two or three people. You know what's the smallest footprint we can start with? Let's not get over get overextended on costs. You know, let's start with a hard current, you know, with a, with a kernel of people who, you know, are good at their jobs, they're independent, you know, they get our vision and so on, right? Um, let's bring in a couple of clients, you know, let's, let's market to the 25 clients that we know really well instead of building our marketing system that's going to, you know, allow us to market to 25,000 clients in the Chicago metro area or what, you know what, start small, but then scale fast. Right. It's sort of take a piece of the vision, market it, sell it when it takes, build in behind it quick. Don't get overextended. 
but sort of you build and compound on your success. So think big, start small, and scale fast. Because if you do things right, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a lot of momentum. And look, a lot of success is exploiting those opportunities as they come. Right? You have a client that that um, that right out of the blue gives you a gig that's gonna keep. You know, if you if you got a ten person firm and you got a client that right out of the blue gives you a gig that's gonna keep five people busy for the next two years. Time to start bringing some more people in. Well, no, we could do with that. You know, we could do it with the folks we can. Scale fast, man. Exploit the opportunity, right? Because you've, you've thought big. You did the right thing. The market gave you an opportunity. Build on it and exploit on it. And really, it's not a more complex success formula than that. There's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts, a lot of things you got to do right. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really that simple formula. What does a firm need to do specifically? And I know this is a big topic, but if you could just simmer it down to scale fast, what are some things that go into that? I I know a lot yeah. of our listeners are at that point, so I wanted to touch on that. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, number one, um, uh, hire behind demand, but hire right behind demand. Okay, we've probably got work for three extra people for some reasonable period of time, next six months. I don't know, it'll be forever. Maybe we shouldn't hire anybody. You know what? You got enough work for three extra people, go hire one. Right? So so there is a sort of a, you know, now we, you know, we've got three people on the beach. Should we hire people? No. But follow on fast, right? If the if 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 you got a little bit of of extra revenue, sorry, right, right? Demands up, hire to match it. Demands up, hire to match it. And so you're always sort of running a little bit behind. You're running a little bit lean, but you got to sort of hit those opportunities. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, particularly in early days, if you think about your firm as a pyramid. You got very senior and sort of completely um, experienced people at the top. You've got project management people, and you've got sort of an apprentice group like this. Don't just build at the bottom. Oh my God! What we really need right now is we got just more, you know, more drafting work that we need to than we can handle. So we just need to hire a couple more junior people. Yeah, you probably do. But maybe you ought to go hire that um, an up and coming project manager who knows clean tech, because we know that's where we got to go, right? You know what? We don't have any. You know, we've got a presence downtown. We don't have any presence in the suburbs. Yeah, we should hire a junior person or two, but. Maybe now it's time to start looking for, for, for a partner level guy who's got to practice out in the suburbs. So, you know, in, instead of sort of scaling down here, which, which will allow you to be more profitable in the near term, but then if you think about how, how people development works, that will help you grow and scale in the future, five to 10 years from now. It's just too late, right? So what you've got to do is you've got to expand the pyramid like this. Look for opportunities to bring in more senior people who've got unique experience, access to different kinds of clients and so on that help you round out your portfolio because then as they come online, they're going to create that compounding effect in terms of the demand. So I think it's those two things. Great. Well, David, thank you for joining me today. David David Coleman is the author of Leading Firms, How Great professional service firms succeed and how your firm can too. That's available online. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And David, let us know how people can get in touch with you and and um, about your website. Uh, our website is www.axiomcp. That's A-X-I-O-M-C as in Charles, P as in Peter.com.
And you can reach me at dkuhlman, D-K-U-H-L-M-A-N, at axiomcp.com. And, uh, you know, it's uh, as I've enjoyed talking to you, I would just tell your listeners we uh, we love to talk to people about their firms and uh, what's going on and so on. You know, that's that's how we get better at what we do. That's the that's the joy of this is to is to really sort of see what people are struggling with and and uh, all kind of learn and grow from it together. So, you know, keep those cards and letters coming. Great. Well. Uh David's firm, if, if you've listened to this and you think that you're a point where you want to scale or that David and his firm could help you out, please feel free to reach out to him. David, wonderful being on the show. Thanks for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. Enoch, thanks a, thanks a ton, and it's been a pleasure. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.